Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kim Brudney, and I am a professor of systematic theology here, and I'm also directing the community engagement program through the Center for Global and Local Engagement. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to a very special evening with a remarkable South African and a remarkable speaker. This event has been coordinated with Bethel University, which has on view right now an exhibit called Between the Shadow and the Light, with works by 10 North American artists and scholars who studied in South Africa in 2013 with 10 African scholars and artists, each one eventually producing a work for the show. The project was sponsored by the Nagel Institute for the Study of World Christianity, which put out a call to artists for a two-week study experience in South Africa, where they would study five themes with which South African artists are, are grappling today. Reconciliation, revisioning, remembrance, representation and resistance. One of the artists featured in the show, Michelle Westmark Wingard, is here tonight. You want to just here. <laughs> Welcome, Michelle. And I would, should also mention that two pieces from the show are on view on the second floor of our Anderson Student Center, and both exhibits are on view through March 20th. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome to our campus Glenda Wildskit. She is a South African human rights activist and peace builder who in 1995 was appointed by South Africa's former president Nelson Mandela to serve with Archbishop Desmond Tutu as a commissioner on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She has since shared her expertise in peace building and reconciliation in many countries, including Sierra Leone and Rwanda. Glenda has worked with political prisoners, their families, exiles, and orphaned ref, uh, returnee children in South Africa and Namibia, and has dedicated herself to human rights, activism, torture, rehabilitation, and racial reconciliation. A registered psychiatric nurse, Win Win uh, Wildskit, was among those who established a trauma center for survivors of violence and torture, the first of its kind in South Africa. And she is also the first South African to be awarded the Health and Human Rights Award by the International Institute for Nursing Ethics. Glenda, it's an absolute honor to have you here. Please help me welcome Glenda to speak on the work of reconciliation. That's a sign of my intimidate, being intimidated. <laughs> um, sort of seeing somebody sitting up in the theater style. Um, but hopefully we can engage with each other later on when we uh, have a Q&A session. Um, I have to say that um, Dr. Faratni Kim has been with me for quite some time. And she's also um, been with me when I presented to the um, students in their study abroad in South Africa. And it reminds me of a, a, a story that the Archbishop Desmond often tells about this professor that um, was very well known. And he traveled throughout the country giving a, a lecture um, and wherever he went, he was accompanied by his driver. Um, and at one point, the professor said to the driver, <clears throat> I'm so sick and tired of giving this lecture, and you've been with me for such a long time. You know the lecture very well. Why don't you give the lecture? <laughs> of course, they agreed, and the professor came into the the hall and went to sit right at the back and the driver 
subsequently delivered the most powerful lecture. Everything was very well done. Um, but when it got to question time, some very clever person right at the back <clears throat> asked the professor a question, which of course he couldn't answer. And he looked into the crowd and said, well, that's actually quite an easy question to answer. It is so easy that my driver sitting at the back is able to answer the question. <laughs> now, when you ask the difficult questions later on, I will ask my host to answer the questions. Um, <clears throat> I would like to spend some time this evening looking at the issue of um, art and reconciliation. And let me declare up front that I'm neither an artist nor am I a reconciler. I just am a human rights activist and work with people who have been traumatized uh, um, through human rights violations and try in, <clears throat> in a small way to ensure that we are able to advance human rights wherever we find ourselves. So I'm going to be rather incoherent at times. And if so, please <laughs> forgive me. Um, because my thoughts are not um, um, scholarly. <coughs> so I would like to explain why arts and cultural work are critical to promoting coexistence and reconciliation in the aftermath of violent conflict and human rights violations. I would like to explore some frameworks for the reconciliation and the nature of aesthetic engagement that explain why the arts and cultural work should be effective resources for peace building and for peace builders. I'd like to offer a few examples of cultural work and art being used to facilitate some tasks critical to reconciliation, including assisting former um, former adversaries to appreciate each other's humanity, to um, empathize with each other's suffering, to address injustice, and to imagine a new future together. With the assistance of artists and cultural workers, many people have survived the trauma of human rights and human rights violations and war and are finding ways to express their suffering and give shape to the experience too horrible often to explain in words. Former enemies are rediscovering each other, uh, each other's humanity, supported by the structures of rituals and the arts. They are addressing painful history and grappling with conflicting narratives in ways that help them gradually to build the trust they need to cooperate in reconstructing their own societies. <clears throat> now I'm completely in their own societies. I um, as promising as these cultural and, and, and artistic initiatives are, their effectiveness could be multiplied if they were better coordinated and with, uh, with other civil society and government efforts. And we see that um, post the work of the Truth Commission where there was a lot of artistic and dramatic arts and the use of music being, being used to um, both to express what had happened in the TRC uh, in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but very often these, these efforts were not coordinated. Um, and I think that a lot can be done if we were to coordinate these efforts much more. So that artists who contribute to reconciliation and peace builders who incorporate their cultural work in their practice 
could benefit from opportunities to share their learning with colleagues and to reflect on the ethical questions that inevitably arise in their work. In a recent conversation with a novelist um, and, and a, a, a um, writer, Professor Njabele, Njabulo Ndebele, um, I went to visit him and he was on a writing retreat and very kindly offered to, to meet with me um, when I was preparing this, this, this paper. And what he said in that encounter was that art, and uh, art is a way in which we can um, help people to empathize and to develop the process of, of empathy. Individuals and communities who may not ordinarily um, encounter each other may experience the story of the other through fiction, through um, narrative, and through storytelling. He told me about some very interesting stories, and I might just quickly share a story he told about two young um, boys who grew up together in a rural area. One, a white boy, who was the, the, the son of the family for which he's, the other young man's uh, family worked, and, and this um, young black boy. They grew up together and, and did not consider race. Um, they were just great pals and did things together. Um, they, of course, were, once they became adults, their paths um, diverted. And um, through some set of strange events, the, the, the black guy um, was arrested or, or, or caught in a um, political protest. And by some twist of fate, the arresting officer was his very friend um, that he grew up with. And so um, Debele explains in this novel about this complex relationship that these two uh, individuals had and through this, this process. So we, we, we see that way, through that story, the the, the, the one individual who became the police officer was able to understand why his friend became a political activist and, and what, what that meant for their relationship. One of the powerful images in um, Hannah Arendt's writing comes not from Arendt herself, but from her citation of a poem, Magic, by Rainer Maria Rilke. Rilke's poem reads, and this is an approximate translation from the German, from indescribable transformation originate, amazing shapes, feel, trust. We suffer often to ashes turn our flames, yet art can set on fire the dust. Magic is here. In the realm of the enrichment, the ordinary word appears elevated, but sounds are real as if the dove called to seek the invisible mate. Arendt cites this poem in, a, in the final section of her chapter on the human condition um, on work. It's part of her discussion of art and her claim that the immediate source of the artwork is the human capacity for thought. And so evoking in us the idea that art can, can help us to think about more deeply about these issues that confront us. I suppose developing empathy while uh, essentially an emotional process requires, <coughs> excuse me, requires deep thought and being able to enter into the world of the other. Art, I would contend, is a powerful mechanism to facilitate this process. It may be tempting to enter into a discussion about art from Arun's um, perspective, 
but I don't think we have time for that tonight. While I was um, preparing for this presentation, I came across a most incredible poem, a short poem that was written after the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I know that some of you know about the Canadian Commission where they investigated the residential schools um, in Canada um, of the uh, Native Americans there. And this poem is by, um, by Rita Jo, and she talks about the loss of her language. I lost my talk, the talk you took away. When I was a little girl, at the school, you took my talk away. You snatched it away. I speak like you. I think like you. I create like you. The scrambled ballad about my world. Two ways I talk. Both ways, I say, your way is more powerful. So gently, I offer my hand and ask, let me find my talk so that I can teach you about me. Very powerful, and I was able to um, understand through finding this poem that it became the basis for a very beautiful um, orchestral work that was developed by a composer called um, Joe Estacio. And he composed a tone poem <coughs> based, on, um, based on this poem, Rita's, Rita Joe's poem. And it's be, it was quite incredible that this work of art was used um, as a setting for Joe's brief but powerful uh, poem, and the same title features in an eloquent score by Canadian composer Joe Estacio. The music was commissioned for orchestra by the former Prime Minister Joe Clark's family for his 75th birthday. A commentator said, I can't recall ever hearing a bad work by Estacio, but the piece ranks amongst the very best compositions for orchestra. The writing is eminently accessible, but never simplistic or condescending. Estacio has a wonderful sense of orchestration, evocative but not cliche. There are bursts of birdsong from the flute and rustle of wind in the percussion and strings. Estacio artfully suggests Joe's sense of having two talks. And the way in which he does this is by having conflicting bitonal sections uh, in the orchestra. I sadly try to find the entire work, orchestral work, to listen to it, but I could not find it. So if there's anybody who has heard this work, or anybody who knows it, please let me let me have a recording of it. I'd really like to, to hear what. Um, not only was there an orchestral work done um, by this uh, 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 commission or, or inspired by this poem, but also a, a, a dance production. So there was a multi-cultural uh, um, expression of the poem. Um, I think that what I'm trying to convey is that a work of art can, in fact, create empathy, and uh, people can step into the world of the other through art. So after receiving this invitation to, uh, to do this presentation and taking yet another look at uh, Kim, at the work that, that was done both here and in South Africa, I asked myself the question, what are the distinctive qualities of aesthetic engagement? And do works of art advance the reconciliation project? I guess the more vexing question is, can works of art 
and cultural work develop within us a sense of empathy necessary for reconciliation to occur. The range of activities um, indicated by the phrase arts and cultural work is very broad. While arts include both oral and written literary forms, narrative, poetry, <coughs> fiction, and nonfiction, they also include vocal and instrumental musical works, both composed or improvised, solo or ensemble. The domain of the arts embraces drawing and painting, photography, movies, and three-dimensional works. I was um, um, privileged to be involved in a, the composition of a cantata that was developed by a South African composer using the exact testimony of people testifying at the Truth Commission and putting that to music. It's a very powerful cantata, um, and there is a copy of, of the work. It's called Rewind. Um, there's a copy here. Uh, Philip Miller uh, used the testimony of people who had come before the Truth Commission and put that to song. We also know that music and song is a central feature of the struggle within South Africa. There was no rally, no political meeting, no funeral, no um, student protest without music. And we know that um, a wonderful um, a documentary film was made called Amandla, Liberation or Freedom in Four-Part Harmony. Um, and it talks about how the music was used both as an education, an educative tool, and also the music was used to rally people to come together. Um, it was also used to comfort. There were lots of songs that were sung to comfort people who had, who had lost. So we know that the, it, not just in the performance or in the, the exhibition of these art, works of art, but also in the way in which people engage with each other that these art forms are used. We also know that there, there's both scripted and improvised theater and dance. Cultural work cultivates the and harvests the knowledge embedded within collective folk, folk expressions like embroidery patterns, lullabies, and folk architecture. These collective expressions of expressive forms are rich with meaning, having been developed over time and transmitted from one generation to the other. Um, we know of a beautiful quilting um, project that has developed in, in Israel with the mothers of the bereaved. And so these are mothers who are uh, um, on both sides of the conflict coming together and they sit together and quilt uh, um, as they, are, they share their stories of their shared uh, bereavement. We know also that that kind of work was um, uh, also developed in um, Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina. Beading and drumming in Rwanda, where communities have come together and they've drummed, to, they drum together, and at first the drumming is sounds chaotic. The rhythms are uh, 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 against each other, almost. I'm trying to find the word. But these rhythms are then slowly start merging together. And once these rhythms come together, the drummers, the people who are involved in the drumming, understand that they are close to coming to some agreement, or close to coming to uh, a, a resolution. The art forms we wish to consider as resources for coexistence and reconciliation therefore include both painting to be viewed in solitary museums and museum goers and the participatory rituals of dance, drumming, and masks. We you know, of course, in the African culture, the use of masks. And it's a, a, a beautiful way of actually almost telling the story 
without um, being seen. So in a way, the mask masks <laughs> who we are and, and, and people are, uh, feel that they are able to, to tell these stories in that way. So engaging with art can generate both individuals and collective uh, uh, um, coming together or, or um, responses to vexing questions of reconciliation. Um, while it is tempting to focus on the aesthetic experience, I would like to say that in the development of empathy, it is difficult to speak about the development of empathy with art talking, uh, through art while not speaking about the um, aesthetic experience. So maybe I should just briefly look at what that is. Firstly, the aesthetic experience engages us in both sensory and cognitive levels. We see colors, images, we hear sounds, we taste flavors, and we feel textures, and we feel temperatures, all within the formal structure that are imbued with stories, narratives, and cultural meaning. In the visual art, symbols convey meaning on many levels simultaneously, in part through literal representation and also through textures and color and composition and shape. Abstract paintings and instrumental music link our senses with our rational faculties as, as we become aware of the ways in which we perceive. In other words, we see ourselves seen. We notice ourselves hearing. And we become aware of ourselves as makers of meaning. And that's very important. Because for a traumatic experience, for people being able to um, work through traumatic experience, they have to ascribe meaning to that experience. What, what does this mean for me as an individual having gone through this traumatic experience? And those of you who have been involved in trauma, trauma work understand this well, that continuously people seek meaning for the way, for why they have been through a, 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 through a traumatic experience. And we, we, we saw that happening in the Truth Commission very often when people came before the Commission and told their stories. They said, but why did this happen to me? Why was this happening? That quest for understanding and meaning for the experience. Um, there's a lot of work being done here at the, this university on the issue of reconciliation. And I understand that many of you are involved in reconciliation studies. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about reconciliation. But perhaps to say, imagine a continuum that displays interpersonal and intercommunal relations according to the degree to which the parties to a conflict acknowledge and act upon their in interdependence. On the one end, we might find complete disregard for the other and thorough denial of the interdependence as, an, as, as it was in, in apartheid South Africa or slavery in the US. And inter interpersonal relationships of deceit manipulation and violence. On the other end of the spectrum, we find not a conflict-free utopia, but rather cooperation, cooperative intercommunal uh, relationships, where decisions are made through democratic and consensual processes, and where conflicts are addressed proactively through agreed-upon procedures and structures. Coexistence as the term is understood by the um, Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, um, um, and I serve on the board of the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, refers to a threshold point 
on, on this continuum where individuals or group, groups shift from reciprocal hate and injury to rudimentary, even grudging, respect. So we are not saying that for reconciliation to occur, people need to shift from hatred and conflict to absolute utopia. We are saying that there's a slow movement across the continuum. And we know that works of art can help that shift occur. That people can, in fact, through the facilitated medium of art, reach a point where they begin to, perhaps grudgingly, understand and respect the other. And enter into the world and the perspective of, of others. So, um, we tried this in what's called the uh, Building an Inclusive Society. Um, after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation developed a Building an Inclusive Society um, program. And in that program, we tried to work with various communities and bring them together so they could, they could share perspectives. One such community was brought together to discuss the, the changing of the street names in their community. And we were able to put um, video cameras in, in their hands and each of these communities went, to, uh, members of the community went around filming um, the process of name change, the reactions of people as these street names were changed from apartheid um, names to a much more inclusive uh, 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 community, um, community names. Um, and you can imagine the resistance of people taking down the street names or renaming buildings and so on. And this has been uh, developed in a, in a, in a film um, that explains the process of how people came to the point where they agreed that these street names should be changed. Archbishop Desmond Tutu refers to the relational aspect of reconciliation in all his writing on the topic, the notion of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a term, which is a the African worldview, that we are because of others. Our existence is tied up in the existence of others. It talks about our interdependence. We um, are human beings because of other human beings. And so the process of reconciliation means after violent conflict and after violent, uh, um, after war and, and, and human rights violations, both the victim and the perpetrator needs to be rehumanized. Because a dehumanization process takes place when a violation happens. And so this notion of Ubuntu is about a restorative process that occurs. And it emphasizes our relationships with each other. So what then is the task of bringing people together and this rehumanizing task? Can it be done unfacilitated? Of course not. We have to use various means and various ways in which we can facilitate this process of um, rehumanizing each other. Because in that human rehumanizing process, the victim and the perpetrators re re look at redressing past injustice and sometimes express remorse. There is a process of granting forgiveness and offering reparations. Reconciliation reflects a shift in attention from blaming the other to taking responsibility for the attitudes and actions of oneself and one's own community. Now, um, some time ago, uh, Kim interviewed me and asked me about 
my thoughts around um, uh, Ubuntu and, and um, this rehumanizing process. It occurred to me then that our relationships with each other is not only because the other is good. Our relationships are so interdependent that we, we relate to each other even if the person, the next one, is evil. We are connected despite the fact that, um, or, or because the fact that others are also good and evil. And we had to confront this in our work in the Truth Commission. We had to confront the fact that somebody can be the most loving father, the most beautiful, um, upright member of the community, a deacon in the church, but also a terrible perpetrator. And there's a story about this family that was called together by, by um, the father. And he, at this point, said to, at the family altar, he said to the family, tomorrow you will see me on TV. I'm going to, I have applied for amnesty. And my amnesty hearing starts tomorrow. And I'd like to tell you, family, that I did not <clears throat> work for a large insurance company, as I told you, for many years. But in fact, <clears throat> I was a member of the security establishment. And in the course of my work, I killed many people. This wonderful father, this incredible husband, this deacon in the church, telling the family that he had killed several people in the course of his work and that he had lied to his family all these years. Before <clears throat> I came onto the Truth Commission, um, I had a conversation with the, um, the opportunity of having a conversation with the um, Secretary General of the World Council of Churches. And in that conversation, he said to me, Glenda, you know through the Truth Commission process, new victims will be, will be revealed. There will be new victims. This story about this father tells us that there were new victims. That family became victims of the father's violations as well. The young man uh, was doing his final year at um, high school, he couldn't bear the thought that his father had done what he had just explained. He went up into his room that night and committed suicide. <coughs> so all of these stories had to be held <coughs> by the commissioners. And all of these stories had to be told in such a way that we could <clears throat> begin to say to ourselves as a country, never again. We do not want to go through these processes again. We do not want to see the dark, ugly history um, that we have been um, subjected to again. And so as a cathartic process, I think, works of art and the ways in which we can process these feelings and these um, um, can be facilitated through art. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> so I have tried to, to say that we have to appreciate each other's humanity and respect each other's culture. We have to tell stories, but we also need to listen. So it's not just in the telling, it's also in the hearing each other's stories and developing more complex narratives and more nuanced understandings of identity. 
We also need to acknowledge the harms. And we need to acknowledge the harms, tell the truth, and mourn the losses. It's very important. What happened um, uh, in an area just um, in Cape Town um, now in 1966, or what was that, how many, 50 years ago? Um, an act was passed that the, that the people needed to be removed from the slopes of Table Mountain um, and removed to dusty townships um, because the area was declared a white area. Um, we now have a District 6 museum, and the museum is part of a global network of, of museums that memorialize past uh, um, injustices and past um, traumas. But what was very interesting about the District 6 Museum was that the um, members of this community were um, approaching the land claims court, had developed a map that they put out on the floor of this museum, and had pinpointed on this map where they had lived before. <coughs> and so during the land claims um, um, process, the land claims court came to the District 6 Museum, and people sat on the very spot where, uh, on the map, where they had lived before, and made their claims from those positions. So it was very unlike a, a, a court proceeding with people haphazardly sitting in different, seemingly haphazardly sitting in different places. But it was a powerful um, metaphor for people claiming their space and claiming what was theirs, but also mourning the loss of, um, um, of, of, of being removed. There's a very powerful story that um, was written by one of the <coughs> members of the District 6. Um, he was a fan of um, pigeon, pigeon, uh, pigeon racing. And he had all of these pigeons. And when their family was <coughs> removed from um, District 6, um, he had the pigeons in a loft in the township that they, they were move, moved to. And after several weeks, he decided that he would try out and see whether the pigeons would fly back to the new home. Of course, he released the pigeons, and um, for days they did not return. And then he thought, I need to go back to District 6 and go and see if my pigeons aren't there. And he tells very powerfully and very poignantly in his story, he tells how he approaches the address, the old address. And there were his pigeons sitting in the old, the old address. And they had not flown back to the new home, the new home, but they had flown back to the old home. A very interesting story because many people, including my grandfather, actually died of heart a broken heart, having been removed from where they had lived and stayed for many years. I'm trying very hard not to cough. <laughs> so, <clears throat> perhaps I want to... Um, come to, to the next part of my talk um, by thinking a little bit about um, what it is that we can do to ensure that we work very hard in bringing communities together and how we can go about facilitating those processes and using our artistic engagement and our aesthetic work to, to make this happen. So having talked about not so pleasant stories, 
um, perhaps I can share with you um, through some cartoons how a cartoonist um, actually depicted the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, <laughs> um, I need to switch this on, and I don't know how. <laughs> I just need to go back or something. Okay, can we go back? Yes, thank you. So we had lots of these posters. <coughs> Excuse me. We had lots of these posters. Um, throughout the work of the Truth Commission, where we said the truth hurts, but silence kills. And tried very hard to encourage people to, to come um, to the various venues we had throughout the country to, to tell these stories. We, we thought that the work of the Truth Commission would be a seven day wonder, um, and that the, the press would lose interest in, in our work, but in fact, they stayed with us, with us for three and a half years. And every Sunday, um, there was an actuality program that, that, that gave a summary or a wrap up of the work of the Truth Commission. It was the most watched actuality program on television in South Africa ever before or after. Zapiro is our, our cartoonist who was really took the mickey out of our work on the Truth Commission and is saying, in response to some of the very um, poor presentations made by the political parties to the Truth Commission and saying this is the whole truth. There was a moment when we were saying, how can we go about um, um, instituting reparation and having some uh, process of, of um, redress? And you can see that the, what we call the new rich, the nouvelle rich, saying, um, stop picking on us. But the old God also saying, stop picking on us. Um, as one of the recommendations that the Truth Commission made was that there should be a wealth tax. And um, this was Sapiro's response to, to that. How do you like his depiction of the Archbishop? <laughs> <laughs> this is our Minister of Justice at the time of the Truth Commission explaining that if we don't find out what's in our past. If we don't deal with our past, the past will haunt us. And that will be part of our, our legacy if we do not deal with, with, with the awfulness of our past. It will keep haunting us. And he was suggesting that a truth commission is one way in which we can deal with our past. One of the... Um, Members of the security establishment is a man named Eugene de Kock. Um, some of the students, in fact, had read a book by Professor um, um, Pumla Madikisela Mandela um, that wrote about her encounter with Eugene de Kock, who was known as Prime Evil. He ran a killing farm, he, he, he headed up a killing farm where people were taken to this place and tortured and killed. And, and uh, members of his team were deployed all over the country to torture and to kill anti-apartheid activists. So at the time of the Truth Commission, with the amnesty process, Eugene de Kock was asked by the Archbishop, what's your name? And he says what his name is. And the Archbishop said, have you listed all um, the crimes for which you are applying for amnesty? And he says, yes, and you see the long list of crimes that he had perpetrated. Because our amnesty process was an individual, you had to apply 
individually for individual violations that have uh, uh, taken place. So, does truth lead to reconciliation? And we often understood and realized that sometimes that was a very difficult process and that sometimes is a big gulf between truth and the process of reconciliation. So the Archbishop standing right at the edge of the precipice saying, oops, there's a difference between truth and reconciliation. Thank you very much for listening. I uh, will now ask him to help facilitate the process of an engagement with you uh, on this issue of art and reconciliation. Is it on? Oh, it is. Uh, hello. Uh, frequently in the United States. Truth Commission, we had to confront the fact that somebody can be a most loving father, the most beautiful, um, upright member of the community, a deacon in the church, but also a terrible perpetrator. And there's a story about this family that was called together by, by um, the father. And he, at this point, said to, at the family altar, he said to the family, tomorrow you will see me on TV. I'm going to, I have applied for amnesty. And my amnesty hearing starts tomorrow. And I'd like to tell you, family, that I did not <clears throat> work for a large insurance company, as I told you, for many years. But in fact, <clears throat> I was a member of the security establishment. And in the course of my work, I killed many people. This wonderful father, this incredible husband, this deacon in the church telling the family that he had killed several people in the course of his work and that he had lied to his family all these years. Before <clears throat> I came onto the Truth Commission, um, I had a conversation with the, um, the opportunity of having a conversation with the um, Secretary General of the World Council of Churches. And in that conversation, he said to me, Glenda, you know through the Truth Commission process, new victims will be, will be revealed. There will be new victims. This story about this father tells us that there were new victims. That family became victims of the father's violations as well. The young man uh, was doing his final year at um, high school. He couldn't bear the thought that his father had done what he had just explained. He went up into his room that night and committed suicide. <coughs> so all of these stories had to be held by the commissioners. And all of these stories had to be told in such a way that we could <clears throat> begin to say to ourselves as a country, never again. We do not want to go through these processes again. We do not want to see the dark, ugly history um, that we have been um, subjected to again. 
And so as a cathartic process, I think works of art and the ways in which we can process these feelings and these, um, um, can be facilitated through art. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> so I have tried to, to say that we have to appreciate each other's humanity and respect each other's culture. We have to tell stories, but we also need to listen. So it's not just in the telling, it's also in the hearing each other's stories and developing more complex narratives and more nuanced understandings of identity. We also need to acknowledge the harms. And we need to acknowledge the harms, tell the truth, and mourn the losses. It's very important. What happened um, uh, in an area just um, in Cape Town um, now in 1966, or what was that, how many, 50 years ago? Um, an act was passed that the, that the people needed to be removed from the slopes of Table Mountain um, and removed to dusty townships um, because the area was declared a white area. Um, we now have a District 6 museum, and the museum is part of a global network of, of museums that memorialize past uh, um, injustices and past um, traumas. But what was very interesting about the District 6 Museum was that the um, members of this community were um, approaching the land claims court, had developed a map that they put out on the floor of this museum and had pinpointed on this map where they had lived before. <coughs> and so during the land claims um, um, process, the land claims court came to the District 6 Museum and people sat on the very spot where, uh, on the map where they had lived before and made their claims from those positions. So it was very unlike a, a, a court proceeding with people haphazardly sitting in different, seemingly haphazardly sitting in different places. But it was a powerful um, metaphor for people claiming their space and claiming what was theirs, but also mourning the loss of, um, um, of, of, of being removed. There's a very powerful story that um, was written by one of the <coughs> members of the District 6. Um, he was a fan of um, pigeon, pigeon, uh, pigeon racing. And he had all of these pigeons. And when their family was <coughs> removed from um, District 6, um, he had the pigeons in a loft in the township that they, they were move, moved to. And after several weeks, he decided that he would try out and see whether the pigeons would fly back to the new home. Of course, he released the pigeons, and um, for days they did not return. And then he thought, I need to go back to District 6 and go and see if my pigeons aren't there. And he tells very powerfully and very poignantly in his story, he tells how he approaches the address, the old address. And there were his pigeons sitting in the old, the old address. And they had not flown back to the new home, the new home, but they'd flown back to their old home. A very interesting story because many people, including my grandfather, actually died of heart a broken heart, having been removed from where they had lived and stayed for many years.
I'm trying very hard not to cough. <laughs> so, <clears throat> perhaps I want to um, come to, to the next part of my talk um, by thinking a little bit about um, what it is that we can do to ensure that we work very hard in bringing communities together and how we can go about facilitating those processes and using our artistic engagement and our aesthetic work to, to make this happen. So having talked about not so pleasant stories, um, perhaps I can share with you um, through some cartoons how a cartoonist um, actually depicted the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, <laughs> um, I need to switch this on, and I don't know how. <laughs> I just need to go back also. Okay, can we go back? Yes, thank you. So we had lots of these posters. <coughs> Excuse me. We had lots of these posters um, throughout the work of the Truth Commission where we said the truth hurts but silence kills and tried very hard to encourage people to, to come um, to the various venues we had throughout the country to, to tell these stories. We we thought that the work of the Truth Commission would be a seven-day wonder um, and that the, the press would lose interest in, in our work. But in fact, they stayed with us, with us for three and a half years. And every Sunday, um, there was an actuality program that, that, that gave a summary or a wrap-up of the work of the Truth Commission. It was the most watched actuality program on television in South Africa ever, before or after. Zapiro is our, our cartoonist who was really took the mickey out of our work on the Truth Commission. And he's saying, in response to some of the very um, poor presentations made by the political parties to the Truth Commission and saying this is the whole truth. <laughs> there was a moment when we were saying, how can we go about um, um, instituting reparation and having some uh, process of, of um, redress and you can see that the, what we call the new rich, the nouvelle rich, saying, um, stop picking on us. But the old God also saying, stop picking on us. Um, as one of the recommendations that the Truth Commission made was that there should be a wealth tax. And um, this was Sapiro's response to, to that. How do you like his depiction of the Archbishop? <laughs> this is our Minister of Justice at the time of the Truth Commission explaining that if we don't find out what's in our past, if we don't deal with our past, the past will haunt us and that will be part of our, our legacy if we do not deal with, with, with the awfulness of our past. It will keep haunting us. And he was suggesting that a truth commission is one way in which we can deal with our past. One of the um, members of the security establishment is a man named Eugene de Kock. Um, some of the students, in fact, had read a book by Professor um, um, Pumla Madikisela Mandela um, that wrote about her encounter with Eugene de Kock, who was 
known as Prime Evil. He ran a killing farm, he, he, he headed up a killing farm where people were taken to this place and tortured and killed. And, and uh, members of his team were deployed all over the country to torture and to kill anti-apartheid activists. So at the time of the Truth Commission, with the amnesty process, Eugene de Kock was asked by the Archbishop, what's your name? And he says what his name is. And the Archbishop said, have you listed all um, the crimes for which you are applying for amnesty? And he says, yes, and you see the long list of crimes that he had perpetrated. Because our amnesty process was an individual, you had to apply individually for individual violations that had uh, uh, taken place. So, does truth lead to reconciliation? And we often understood and realized that sometimes that was a very difficult process and that sometimes is a big gulf between truth and the process of reconciliation. So the Archbishop standing right at the edge of the precipice saying, oops, there's a difference between truth and reconciliation. Thank you very much for listening. I uh, will now ask him to help facilitate the process of an engagement with you uh, on this issue of art and reconciliation. Is it on? Oh, it is. Uh, hello. Uh, frequently in the United States, uh, public schools have been cutting art programs. How do you feel that the reduction in education of arts will impact our future generation to deal with problems uh, that may arise, as you've outlined? Mm. Shall I take a few? Uh, one at a time. Okay. So, um, well, I think it's a means to, 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 towards understanding as an educa education tool, um, a way in which we can begin to facilitate the process of developing empathy and understanding of knowledge, um, uh, gaining knowledge, of being reflective and thinking more deeply about these issues, of engaging in dialogue. Um, so it's a means to, to an end. I don't think that it is the only way in which we can foster reconciliation, but it is a powerful tool that we can use. Um, and sometimes it also assists people to be one step removed from the intensity, for example, in storytelling, um, in narrative, in sharing, and so on, um, or through dramatic um, um, uh, representations. So I think it is a means um, and that we should explore all means and ways in which we can foster reconciliation across diverse communities. Thank you so much for your talk. I just have, um, if I'm not mistaken, the District 6 Museum is not uh, incorporated into the Zico museum system, is that correct? In your opinion, what do you find the pros and cons of that being? I think it's kind of complicated, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's also important that the um, Department of Arts and Culture and, and that the government also takes responsibility for ensuring that these places of remembrance are supported. Um, so while there's a sense of autonomy in the, in the governance structures of, of, of places like the District 6 Museum, 
the kind of support that can come from government, um, financial support and others otherwise is also important. But we, we could run the risk that that autonomy uh, um, 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 is compromised. So, um, but I think the, the whole Eco Museum's processes have, uh, and the structures have really um, stepped up to the plate. I mean, the, um, the, the uh, apartheid museums, for example, and the processes of, of, of um, Robben Island and all of these sites of memory, um, particularly on the Cape Flats, where they have the various massacres that had, that had occurred um, in the townships, having these memorializations and supported by, by the, either the local government or by uh, national government um, is important for the maintenance as well. Uh, yeah, but, but you're quite right, you know, they, it, we run the risk of, of being compromised in terms of the narrative and how the story is portrayed. Uh, do you ever imagine or dream of um, a truth and reconciliation here in the United States where uh, even the mention of reparations for slavery causes a lot of uh, resistance? There are people, uh, elected members, people who have power who have actually resisted even that name of reparation. So how do we move from that dark place that I saw the cartoonist portraying, or are we just going to continue talking about the dark, stinky things are buried? It's a difficult question. It's a very difficult question to answer. I. I don't know whether I have the answer. But I do know that it's important that the stories are told and that there's official acknowledgement of the harms that have been done to people through slavery, through oppression, and so on. Um, because as we understood in, in the South African context, if we don't do it, it will haunt us. And it will emerge and pop up in different manifestations and in different ways throughout the generations. Um, but there needs to be political will for such a process to occur. Um, I know that some of you know that there was a community led Truth and Reconciliation Commission here in your country, uh, in Greensboro, where um, a Truth Commission was established to look at the violations that occurred in the bus boycott and um, in the civil rights, during the civil rights movement. So, um, and that, but that was a community-sponsored TRC, very powerful, absolutely powerful, um, there's a lot of material on um, on internet. I was saying the other day that Google has now become a verb. Um, it used to be a noun before, but it's now a verb. So, you know, Google the, the Greens for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and see what those commissioners said. And um, we had the opportunity of being here when they were commissioned, when the commissioners were commissioned. Um, but for an official process, a state-sponsored process to occur, there needs to be political will. And I know that in many parts of the world, um, people would rather opt for amnesia, would rather opt for trying to bury the violations that <coughs> had occurred in the past and try to move on uh, um, ignoring the hurt that, that had been done. But also in a very litigious 
society, um, the issue of compensation and um, reparation becomes more prominent than the actual process of healing. So people demand lots and lots of money, millions and millions of dollars by way of reparation in a litigious society, rather than focusing more on the healing aspect and the, the reconciliation aspect of redressing the harms of the past. So I, I don't know how to answer your question, but I do know that some truth recovery process needs to happen. I was here last year in, in your country, um, September to November, and you will remember just last year there was so much shooting happening, the schools shooting. And I wondered, what is it in the psyche of a community that leads, that pushes people to a point where they can kill the other? What, what is it in the psyche of a community? What, what, what's happening when everything seems to be OK, and yet we have these, these explosions of violence happening, which seem, on the surface, to be inexplicable. They, on the surface, seem to be inexplicable. But I think a lot has to do with the fact that we, in, and, and not just here, many parts, in my country also now, people are saying, you know, that's the past. We are born free now. We, we're living in a new democracy. Why are you? telling us about these things. Why are you talking about these things? We don't want to deal with this. We're in a new generation. But the past does haunt us. It will flare up. And it is now, you see, all these protests in South Africa happening. Student violence, student protests, protests, municipal um, service delivery protests and so on happening. Because we just have not completed the task. We haven't finished the task. And it's an ongoing task that needs to happen to deal with the violations of the past. First of all, I'd like to thank you for coming and doing the work that you're doing. I'm from Liberia. We are 14 years of civil war. Yeah. And we also said we did do reconciliation. But from listening to you, I think you have a better system. Uh, as indicated by the death of Mandiba, the, world, the whole world was down there. The whole world, most of the world leaders were down there. That shows how much work you've done to, to actually get out to humanity. Um, and so my only question is, I think it's a year or so, a number of Africans who work in South Africa were harassed, some of them were killed. So I'm wondering, a country that actually advocates reconciliation, was that a good message uh, to the rest of Africa? I mean, especially at the time when, when you were doing the struggle, all of the world, most of Africa was on your side, including this yes, country. Yes. So I'm wondering, what was that about, that yeah. you know, Africans were killing another African for another country? Yeah. A country that advocated reconciliation. Having said that, you did a, a good job compared to Liberia. So I, I mean, I listened to you, what you said, name, name, change, change street names and things like that. So it's by far much better. I just want to say that. Yeah. The, I was privy to the work of the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Sierra Leone Commission. In fact, I was in Freetown for quite some time, just after the signing of the Lome Agreement and um, the implementation of the Lome Peace Accord there. So I'm very aware of the troubled times that Liberia and Sierra Leone experienced. Um, and somehow the, the difficulty of the Truth Commission, I think you will agree that the Truth Commission in Liberia did not have the kind of 
political support that 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 was meant to be. Um, I, I believe that in the Liberian situation, people were saying, let's, let's have a truth commission so we can find out who the buggers are. Um, in other words, that there was, in many ways, a sense of revenge and, um, and lots of work, peace work, had to happen in the background to ensure that the, the commission was at least uh, um, got to hear some of the violations that had taken place uh, uh, in, your, in the conflict. Now, about the issue of the, uh, what's called the xenophobic attacks that happened in 2008, and again more recently in 2014 in South Africa. And um, for many analysts, it was a complete mystery as to why this was happening. Um, some people suggested that it was around um, access to very limited resources. So people living in very impoverished um, situations um, and then having um, what they call foreign nationals also then competing for these very limited resources and that that was the spark that set off uh, um, these xenophobic attacks. Um, um, to the credit of both the local governments and the regional governments, uh, uh, provincial governments and national governments, stepped in very rapidly because otherwise it could um, descend into an almost civil war. Um, and I know that because just at the time of the 2008 um, xenophobic attacks. I was part of a mediation team that actually went into these communities to mediate and to ensure that the communities were safe enough for those um, foreign nationals to go back to where, they, to, to where they were staying because many of them fled into churches and, and other places. Um, and so that rapid intervention um, played a big role in ensuring that it did not um, descend into a, a almost civil war. Um, many people predicted that it would happen again because of the slow pace of service delivery um, in some areas in the country. And of course it did flare up again, but very briefly in 2014. We haven't had any um, um, such incidents since then. And that is because of in many instances, the work of non-governmental organizations and non-profit organizations, such as the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, Institute for the Healing of Memories, and other organizations who are doing continued dialogue work. And so building an inclusive society that I referred to in my talk is one such um, program that is working on ensuring that people who are not South African are also part of those communities and are, 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 are seen as to be part of those communities. But it's, been, it's, it's, it's a terrible blot on, on, on South Africa's history and particularly dem democratic history that these attacks had happened because we do recognize that during the height of apartheid, particularly the frontline states, um, were very supportive of, of people who went into exile and of the uh, liberation movements. So it's, it's a shameful um, moment in our democratic history. Um, I'm just a bit curious. Um, there's a couple different approaches that I've seen um, in teaching particularly children about what has happened. Um, as, we, as we've seen, the U.S. has a bit of um, sweetening or hide, hiding a lot of what had happened with slavery. Um, I know Rwanda's taking an approach of more honesty so as uh, to kind of help that prevention piece. And um, there are a couple of more dictatorships that are more keen to hide some of the uglier facts of mm. their past. What approach is South Africa taking in 
their history courses. <laughs> Many approaches. <laughs> <coughs> well, let me switch this off. It's important to, to understand that there are many competing, there are competing agendas. Um, and in any situation, there will be competing agendas about what approach to take to deal with the past, to deal with plotting a way forward. Um, I have to say that in South Af to South Africa's credit, we have a very vibrant civil society. Very vibrant. And in fact, I believe that the fact that we had such a vibrant civil society was a big contributory factor to our liberation struggle and to the fact that we had got to the point much sooner than most people had, had thought we would. And that we had such a peaceful transition. Can you imagine the kind of violence that we had right up until the, um, the, the date of election when, when we went for to vote? Hmm? There were, there were uh, violence monitors deployed everywhere because we thought that there would be uprisings and people would... But people stood in queues long queues, peacefully, to cast their vote. It, it's incredible. And it's in a, almost inexplicable. Hmm? And that, that sense of, we want to have a new dispensation, carried itself through the work of the commission, during the Truth Commission, you know, I mean, I've shared with you some of the awful, awful stories that we heard. Hmm? But not one revenge attack. Three and a half years of hearing about people being thrown to crocodiles, people being murdered, people being tortured, people being disappeared, women being raped, not one revenge attack. It's incredible. And somebody once asked Archbishop Desmond, how is that possible? And he said, it must be in the water. Something we drink. But there are competing agendas now. Um, we have to deal with the, the grand apartheid legacies. The socioeconomic issues, the issues around education, issues around health care, issues around land repossession, the issues of health um, care, yes, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you know that very soon after our democracy, we had the huge HIV AIDS uh, um, problem that put place huge burdens on our social and health systems. So, we have to also engage with people who think differently. Now with the student uprisings, we have young white Afrikaner students who are saying, you know, what is this thing around um, affirmative action? What is this issue around, you know, uh, um, ensuring that, that students from disadvantaged communities have access to, to education and have access to universities and are in certain ways put onto a articulated programs and fast-tracked and so on. What is this business? You know? And they don't understand the difference between equality and equity and the way in which we have to now ensure that people have an op a step up and have an opportunity to enter into the mainstream and not be marginalized. And we've got, to work, we've got to work at that. So as I was saying, the work of reconciliation and bringing former adversaries together is not a once-off process, 
but it's a long journey and sometimes a very long, difficult journey that we have to embark on. There was a question here somewhere. A couple questions about torture, uh, because the United States since 9-11 has engaged in such, and there's, it's been raised in the current presidential election. So first question is, why did the apartheid regime torture? Was it to, for intelli to gain intelligence, or was it to terrorize? And second, how effective was it at either of those goals? And third, as to reconciliation, how did the arts play into either s helping the torturers or the victims uh, re recover. And then lastly, as an aside, you just said people don't understand the difference between equality and equity. Uh, and I just add, I think I know the answer to that, but I'd like you to, to tell us what, what in your mind the difference is. Thank you. You do pack a punch. <laughs> um, well, there are several ways that torture was used not just to intimidate, but also to get intelligence. Um, many of my comrades who were tortured were tortured because they wanted to ensure that, um, that they get intelligence about political activities, underground activities that was happening. But it's also used as a, a method to, to terrorize people and to ensure that people don't get involved, to prevent them from getting involved politically and become docile um, because of the fear of being arrested and, and tortured. I must say that um, over time, the torture methods became very uh, um, sophisticated. Um, in the earlier days of, of, of apartheid, the torture methods were mainly brute force and um, people were just bashed around and so on. Um, just because it was fun for, for, for the torturers to do so. But we became very aware that the torture methods became extremely sophisticated. And the implication of that is or, uh, that professionals were involved. So psychologists and medical uh, people were all involved in developing these torture methods. All medical people were brought in to, to examine somebody who was being tortured and given the, the go-ahead that they could still continue to torture this person because the person won't die. Um, but there, was, there, was, there were also um, uh, uh, instructions from the State Security Council to eliminate or to kill people and not just to uh, um, just to torture them for information, but to actually kill them so to suppress the kind of um, uh, uh, uprisings and um, political activity in a certain community. It's interesting because F.W. de Klerk, who was the man who received the Nobel Peace Prize with Nelson Mandela, in fact, at his submission in the Truth Commission, said he didn't know that all of this was happening. Yet he was the most, um, the most conscientious member of the State Security Council. So the State Security Council was saying, eliminate so and so. You know, in, encrypted code um, for various things. Um, um, so that was the issue around torture. What was the second question about? Yes. Yes. So, very often the work that I do with with torture survivors and with people who would be involved in in torturing is to use the narrative approach and to get these people to a place where they can share their stories. So in this instance, often it's not just art for the sake of art or, or for the aesthetic aspect of art. 
but using an art form, a narrative form, to get people to be able to tell their stories. Um, um, Father Michael Lapsley does a lot of work with um, in the Institute for the Healing of Memories. And the format of the workshops, when they bring former adversaries together, is for them to, at the end of the process, to develop symbols of peace or symbols to move.